guys. Hello. It's all right. That's it. We got everybody. Yeah, the as the kids say. All right, we're gonna. We saw this movie just now, and uh, I have a few questions. Then we're gonna open it up to our crazy, crazy audience here. Thank you guys have questions. They seem sane. They seem to. They, they are. Um, where do we begin? Uh, I always like to begin with where does this movie come from? How did it get here? And I mean, how long is? Okay. In general, how long does this take to put together? Because uh, it looks like three and a half years, something like that. Three and a half years, and I, we're not going to ask about the budget, but every cent is on the screen, that's for sure. I think every cent was just in doing the logos in the beginning. <laughs> the uh, uh, three years, um, uh, you were going to do a Spider-Man movie, and you decided to... Uh, well, how did you come to the decision to do this idea of the different dimensions? Well, we started with uh, the idea of uh, you know making a movie for Miles Morales, right. and who was uh, you know one of our favorite characters in the Marvel universe, and an amazing book, and an amazing story, and a really amazing uh, family. And we thought that, that, that where he was coming from and where his family was coming from, trying to help him be the kind of, kind of guy that he wanted to be, figure out who that guy is. That just seemed like a really powerful place to start. And then uh, we thought, well, I'd be neat for him to interface with Peter Parker and maybe we could take a different tactic uh, on Peter and see where he's at in his life as he's getting a little older and put him in a position that he's never been in before, which is that of a mentor. And, you know, he's never been an older and wiser. We thought, oh, that would be something he didn't know how to do and had never done before. And then we started to think about, well, how would that actually work with such a different dimension? And then we got a little carried away. <laughs> <laughs> now, but wasn't there a comic book about the different dimensions? Or am I wrong? I, that's yeah. true. There is a comic book called Spider-Man, and uh, I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of bummed. I was like, oh, I guess someone already had that idea. Um, and uh, But then, you know, it was, it was great. It gave, gave us a, a lot of great reference. And, and, um, um, my brain just, my brain is just jumping around. Did you, did you also think that let's get every wacky version of Spider-Man that they that they did throughout the years to make it you know, completely different? I mean, there's not enough movie for that, huh? right? Right. But you chose these particular particular ones, and you had to have Spider Ham in there for for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, was there any other uh, besides the Miles Morales comic? Were there other? Did you do extra research? I mean, you probably grew up reading these comics in the first place, but uh, did you go back and look at stuff or what was happening now in the comics? Because to me this looks like, a, I don't even, it looks like nothing I've ever seen. On the one hand, it looks like it looks like graphic novels today to me. It really looks like a modern version of a graphic novel come to life. Uh, again, did you did you guys look at that uh, design-wise or just for stories? or? Yeah, I mean, definitely every day we looked at it. Um, uh, we, were, we were trying to, to find something, you know, with the opportunity to make a, a, a feature animation version of a Spider-Man story, um, that in and of itself was such a was such a gift um, that you know to the, the medium of animation that we could um, you know it was like we should go as far as we can and um, we're adapting comic books and let's look at the source material and see if there's a way it's a visual storytelling um, you know source material and. and and it tells stories in a really succinct, really powerful, dynamic way with single images, and, and so that was really the impetus for a lot of um, the visuals we ended up with. And uh, um, when we, from the beginning, when we had the mild Peter relationship was the heart of the thing, and then when the idea to open up to the rest of the multiverse came, the first one obviously was Gwen because she's such an iconic character, and that book was really inspiring from an art artistic standpoint, and. And she just was so cool. Uh, it was a really obvious choice. And then the idea for the other three of the Motley crew was both to try and get as different characters as possible, um, both from a worldview standpoint and also uh, from an animation standpoint of like, how could we get three characters that were animated in totally different styles that wouldn't belong together? That to see a black and white character next to a cartoon Looney Tune style pig. Uh, you know, next to an anime girl with her mech suit, uh, so that you're like, is this, is the movie broken? Uh, <laughs> and that was the idea. Well, yeah, I for one want to see more with all of those characters. Uh, I would just throw that in there. I mean, a lot of my nerd is going to come out on this panel. Um, 
How did you guys break up? I mean, I'm jumping all around here, but how did you break up three people directing this movie? And then you two guys are really powerful uh, creative producers as well. So how did that how did that work out? I mean, did one person handle one aspect of it, and some people say, I don't know how that, I don't even know how you do this. It it was um, <clears throat> just kind of a it was a real mixed bag because we all have different fields of expertise that you know we sort of have our strengths in, but we also have a lot of overlap. And I think that probably goes for kind of everybody on sitting on the panel that, you know, the, the uh, we all overlap in just the, the general you know, cinematic storytelling and and uh, the you know the way uh, the way that we kind of like movies and comedy and all animation all those things. And the the important thing was that we had a kind of a singular vision stemming from the first treatments that Phil ever wrote, and they all had the the spirit and the tone of the movie, it, everything was already kind of crystallized right there. So there was a lot of work to do to sort of like find the right combination of elements that finally made up the finished movie, but all along we had a really clear target. And without that, I think it, it probably would have been a lot more chaotic and painful than it was, and it was chaotic and painful. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but not between us. <laughs> yeah, well, we all kind of like like when I look at the movie now, it's like I look at, it's like I'm looking at a really really cool piece of pottery, and I can see all of our fingerprints on it, but it's all one piece. It's hard to tell where one begins and the other ends, but I can see clearly everyone's influence. And I guess yeah, I mean anybody up here could have made the movie by themselves; it just wouldn't have been as good. Yeah, and they probably would have died. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it wouldn't have been done. It would, not have been yeah, it, would have been it would not have been finished. It would not have been finished. And, you know, it was such a bear, and, and, you know, this is like, everybody here has a superpower, and, uh, and you know, we all like each other, and, uh, and, and we appreciate one another, so there's a lot of um, support for trying to get the thing that everybody, you know, that's the most far out thing about everybody on this stage, get that onto the screen, as opposed to shaving it down so that it becomes a generic thing. It's like, a, you know, it's like a band. You want, like, you want everybody to band to shine and contribute something. Yeah, and, you know, we definitely, like, I mean, like it all, you know, in some ways it starts, you know, like Phil and Chris, when, you, when they're your producers, like, what they were saying during the process is they're basically saying to us, um, go as far as you possibly can. You know, it's literally what was said over and over again in, in uh, you know, different, uh, you know, reviews and stuff is, is we want we want to be able to say to you you've gone too far, you know that was you know, you know and then a lot of like good nature and sometimes really passionate arguments about you know you know the whole the whole ethos of, 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 of we've seen this before so can we do something different here you know like and pushing to that not just us it's like obviously we're here representing hundreds of people and a lot of departments all of who had we're operating under that same attitude. Okay, a couple of questions on the visual design of this film, because how did you, I'm just throwing this out, I'm just thinking out loud here, but how did you come up with that? Was there a day, were you fishing for this? You, there was a day where it all kind of came together, so that's what we want the film to look like. I mean, give me some story about, about when did this happen, and how did you even get to it? You know. Well, from the very beginning, we were we had this the idea that we could use animation as a way to tell uh, a, a comic book story that felt like you were actually walking into the pages of a comic book. We often felt that you could look at uh, art of books of animated movies and see these beautiful impressionistic paintings and beautiful, and you could see the hand of the artist. And then the finished product, you could see the inspiration, but it wasn't uh, as tactile as the original art. And so the idea was like, well, we have all this, we've developed all this uh, concept art now. Why can't we just make it look exactly like this? Yeah. But but in moving in three dimensions and uh, and the, our production designer Justin Thompson and our VFX supervisor Danny Damian were always like yeah let's do it and then they would say it's we don't know how to do it <laughs> but let's do it um, and it took I mean it was I would say a year and a half of development of various different things of trying textures and trying to make all the light half tone dots and without it making people look like they were had acne um, and uh, and having the shadows be hatch marks and having all the textures be, be painted uh, and textural and having the text boxes and everything feel like it was integrated into one thing and didn't feel like CG characters in a 
hand-drawn world, and it felt all like it was one thing. And while we were developing the, the first shots, at the very beginning, and we were for the, the teaser trailer, we were like the first shot that we were trying to get done. And when we finally got one, they were like, yes, this is what the movie looks like. We were so excited. But we were a year away from coming out, and we still had the whole movie to, to, to do. It's <laughs> so, like now do it 89 more times. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, uh, what, one question people are asking me is, uh, what are we looking at? Meaning, is this a CG film? Is it hand-drawn? Are there hand-drawn elements? Tell me about yeah. that. Aspect. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, and yes. yes. But mainly, yes. all of the above. It's, I mean, it's, it is, yeah. It's created in a computer, so it's, in that sense, it's absolutely a CG film. Um, the, the thing that really, um, I think, makes people feel like it's, it looks and feels different is because, um, you know, you have these wonderful environments that, you know, we were able to, I think we were able to be really successful with the environments much earlier than we were with the characters. Um, and so part of, of how finding, um, the versions of the characters that could live in these environments but still feel, you know, still have the ability to emote in a, in a naturalistic way and, and let, and let, and let um, the story really resonate and you feel the feelings that are, you know, the laughter and, 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 and the, the drama of the movie, we, we, we kept going back to the drawings of the character design and we kept looking at that and looking at comic books and saying, like, the thing that really um, is, is expressive and powerful is the line work. How can we get line work into a CG film on a character? Um, and so what we ended up doing was we we took 2D sort of philosophies of you know let's animate on twos as opposed to every other CG film out there that's on ones and, and because all their sims run on ones like if you want hair and cloth and you name it camera moves it needs to be on one. Well let's let's make a really big problem by doing it all on two for for the rest of the pipeline. But like in animation it's going to look awesome. But we have to figure out how to make it, you know, come out the other end and look like, um, you know, not let have anyone, you know, pass out. Um, so, so really, um, our our team developed this incredible tool of being able to both puppet a CG, um, or you know, yeah, char puppet a CG character, and then on top of it, draw. Like every time you see line work on those characters, expressive line work on their faces, it was drawn by an animator. And, and it's, I mean, every single frame is drawn by an animator and it's all on twos and, and, it, and, it, and it just gives a sense of like you feel it more, it makes the animation crispier and, and crunchier and, and a lot more evocative. Um, and, and it was, I think that's the stuff that, that finally we got that and we fit it into the background and it felt like a cohesive world um, that was really immersive. We, we wanted the whole production to facilitate the conversation between the artist making the movie and the people watching it on the screen. So anything that created a veil between that, we tried to peel for. And any digital tools we were creating, they were just there to help the movie be more expressive, to feel more like a painting, to feel more like, you know, to feel the hand of the person animating. We wanted, you know, the reason we fell in love with graphic novels and sequential art and, and this medium is because you could always feel an artist communicating to you directly right. on the page. Every single artist interprets Spider-Man differently. Yeah. And so we wanted to feel those, we, you know, we, we, I would rather be inconsistent and feel each individual animator on screen, yeah. right, than to feel it like, oh, it's all sick yeah. and shiny. I mean, I think if you look at this, there's, a, there's, a, there's the ability to really glean this, like, oh, continuity is actually not that important. <laughs> like, like there's a lot of stuff in here where if you're looking for like literal continuity, you can pick it apart. But what you're getting is emotional continuity and performance continuity, yeah. and you're and you're and sometimes it's more fun to to cut to a shot and have a reveal of a new attitude on a character as opposed to see them finding that attitude. Yeah, I mean, I really felt like I I love these guys. I love you know Miles. I love Spider Gwen. I mean, there's a couple of shots in here where it's just reactions. I noticed uh, I saw twice that there's this where they're. So, not so like, but they're facing, you know, right or something, and the drawing is it's just an expression. It's just like a, uh, you know, or something like that, and it's so cool. And I, where does that come from? Is that just on the storyboard, and you, you, you actually, and it's not even moving, and you, 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 you construct, you, you draw that, or did you do it in CG, and then you still did your technique over that? Is that what happened? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you yeah. answer my own question? Truly, yeah, no, for real. It's, it's both. It's like um, the goal was to make it look like and feel like a drawing, and so. Um, you would use the puppet, the CG, you would draw on it, and then when when our magical lighting, um, you know, production designer and art director got in and, and, and our lighting team, 
they made it, that they went all the way back to where, where it felt like you were just peeling through the pages of the comic book. I want to quickly mention, because we're mainly an animation group here, but I definitely have to mention the voices and music, because uh, uh, I got a chance to see it twice, so the thing is, the second time around, I was really paying attention to things like that, and the music is fantastic in the background. So there's one scene, I forgot what scene it is, but it's just percussion, it's just, you know, drums, that's so powerful. Um, and uh, what, what, what can we say about that? Is there anything that we can, that's just amazing stuff. I mean, so our common composer is Daniel Pemberton. Yeah. Um, he's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, he, um, you know, we we listen to a bunch of people who are also great. What we what we love about Daniel, you know, what when you listen to four, you, know, you when you're when you're hiring a composer, you often get a few of their scores. And with Daniel in particular, we got four or five of his scores, and they all sounded totally different. You know, which. Which I think really drew be, uh, a sense of Usually you worry. Huh? <laughs> usually you worry about you that. Know, but, and they're all good. You know, like, yeah. but, 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 but he clearly had this like, kind of like searching, experimental soul. You know? And that's, you know, you know, it's a gut thing for, for our team. It's like you look for people like that, you know, for a movie like this. You know, like he, and then we, then we met with him or we interviewed him and he had some really cool ideas involving, you know, his early ideas involved kind of like score mixed with, uh, you know, turntables and, you know, kind of like scratching into a score. And that was just a kind of early idea, but but we like that thinking a lot. You know? It was like, I want to scratch the orchestra. Yeah. I want to <laughs> press it onto a record. And yeah, and it, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, he pressed it onto the vinyl, right? And then he scratched it. Yes, yeah, you know. So anyway, so, so he isn't just a brilliant composer. He also just had he had the spirit that we really uh, reacted to, and, and and when his music started to come into the movie, it it, uh, it it lifted it up a lot. You know, yeah. like you know, it really integrated and and you know. Really Although I was just going to say, the great thing is he could still bring the emotions that we wanted. I mean, with everything we did, with the visuals, with and anything we brought into the movie, none of it was going to work unless it evoked the emotion and put you inside the experience of the characters. And Daniel's music, we knew we didn't want uh, yet another stereotypical superhero score with the choir and the, you know, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And, uh, you know, for, for Miles and for Brooklyn for 2018, we knew we wanted to integrate hip hop into into the score somehow. And Daniel just, like, was a fish to water with that stuff and held on to the storytelling aspect of the, sto of the score which, you know, heightens all of our emotional beats. And the amazing soundtrack also weaves in with his music, and his music is over some of the music, the big, right. what we call the Rise Up scene, when he's on the top of the building deciding to jump off. They put this song, What's Up Danger, which is a delightful song, and, and, uh, and it was sort of a, that Daniel was involved with, with bringing the score in on that, and, and, the, and the final song has some of his music in it. So the whole thing just flows from one song to the next, so it all feels uh, seamless. The, uh, we could spend too much time on this, and no, no offense to the voice people, but we want to stick with art. But uh, I, I feel like I should talk about, at least quickly, about some of the voice acting, because it's unbelievable. It's great acting, and I'm, I don't even know how you got that. I mean, I, you know, it's I mean, I know. directing. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> wow. No, but, I mean, I'm so used to movies where every character is sort of the same, and you know, whether they're cliche or they're, you know, they're, they're sort of kind of the same idea, and the, and the voice direction is is pretty the same. And this, I felt, these were completely different characters. Every, not just the spider characters, but his family, him. I mean, it's just so many, you know, different things. I don't even know. Uh, how do you tell them what to do? With they're, they're thinking they're doing a cartoon, a Spider-Man cartoon. Yeah. You know, what, what are they? I don't think any of them thought that, though. Uh, honestly, yeah. all, every single actor we were, we were lucky enough to get to work with, um, every time we were pitching the movie to them to try and, and, and convince them to work on it, um, they were engaged with the story and their role in it and, and who their character was. And we really, you know, we really tried to make this film feel naturalistic and and um, from the you know making Miles' neighborhood feel like a character and then the, the characters that filled that neighborhood um, as authentic as possible and everyone that we got in there we were I mean from Mahershala to Brian and, and, and Shamik and, and Luna and like that little core group in and of itself that's its own movie um, and then you take all the other people we got on top of it that are in the Spider-Verse um, we were just really fortunate. Well, like, like, for example, this is, maybe this is the writing, uh, or maybe, but, but like, for example, I'm remembering one scene, one quick shot, which at the beginning where uh, 
they tell him the shoes are untied. He goes, yeah, you know, that's a choice. It's all under his breath, kind of. Un you know, that's a choice. Like, where is that the way it was written, or it just seems so perfectly acted? Uh, you know, it was written that way. But I will, one thing I'll say is that there was a little bit of a feedback loop that that happened with our animators, um, where once we started getting footage back and seeing how the animators were 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 crafting performances, um, they were doing a lot with silences and um, stutters, and we found that our more, I don't have to say quiet lines, but we found that our, you know, the lines that, that had more, you know, stutters or stops and starts in them tend to be animating in a more expressive way, and that started to affect our writing, and that started to affect our directing in the, in the booth and where we would push the performers, because we, we started to see that, oh, the more we can just kind of push them in that direction, get them, you know, in. And then when we're in edit, start to choose takes that um, might not be perfect takes, but might not even be the perfect words that were written, but somehow uh, had some kind of, you know, expressiveness or, 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 or reality, and or whatever, something in them. You know, we, we just started to gravitate towards those takes because we were getting excited by what the animators were doing. And also, uh, we were able to be lucky enough to get some, occasionally have some of the actors perform together, like we had Shamit and Jake perform together on a number of occasions, and so a lot of their back and forth has a real natural rhythm to it, it didn't feel like canned, uh, and similarly we were able to get um, Shamik and Brian together, who plays his dad, uh, for the, the cop car scene at the beginning, so it feels like, um, you know, it, it, it feels natural, and, and, and everybody was directing them to have a real open performance, and to try things, and to keep, you know what the, the goal of the scene is and what your mood is and the feeling that you want to have and let's just try a bunch of stuff and what would you really say in this moment because you just wanted to get to an authentic uh, performance more than you know, the specificity of the words. Okay, everybody get ready. I'm going to throw it open shortly. I have a few more geek questions. Um, uh, the hand-drawn uh, Spider-Ham stuff uh, without, had to be a, a, a particular artist that you brought in to do that. Who was that? Paul Rudish. Paul Rudish? Craig Kelman. Oh, Craig Kelman. Oh, 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 oh my god, Paul Rudish just went, I did. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'm thinking, wow, exactly. probably. Let's convince well, him that he Craig Kelman did the Craig Kelman, right? That was yeah. Kelman. Yeah, because yeah. Kelman did like model sheets for us early, early on. And, um, you know, because everything in the film, except for that little intro bit, is yeah. actually CG um, for Ham. Um, but, but really inspired um, by Kelman's drawings. And then when we had no more time, Really, to, to animate, um, Kelman did that that intro bit by hand, and it actually ended up working out wonderfully. <laughs> um, we had one animator up in Vancouver in particular. Was it, was it Ryan? Um, yeah, there was. Yeah, exactly. There was. I mean, yeah. I don't want to. I'm sure you'll go out there, but like the, what our animators did on this movie. I mean, Penny is 100% CG. Penny, Penny is like a three-dimensional character, and uh -huh. and. And they developed these tools that allowed them to just genuinely sculpt every single frame um, and carve away. They would form the puppet, and then they would just carve away anything that didn't feel um, necessary. Uh, it was really, I, for them, it was um, like a labor of love, definitely. They were averaging like a second a week. <laughs> I just so I was, this is now inside, really ridiculous inside, but I was at the screening yesterday and Orson Bean was in the audience. Was he in the film? No, he's my neighbor. Is he your neighbor? <laughs> That's my, weird. my family are in town and, uh, and he has a guest house. And my sister and her kids are staying there. <laughs> well, okay, no, 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 I thought he was Uncle Ben or something. It, it, it was like, because when you go on IMDb, they don't listen to the entire cast for some reason. So I still Ben's Cliff Robert. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. That's the classic clip. That's yeah. the OG Uncle yeah. Ben. Oh, yeah. The, oh, speaking of voices, now that you're, we, we, we must mention Stan Lee. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I don't even, obviously, uh, he was still alive and kicking and all that when you were, I guess, recording him and making them. But I hope so. Yeah, I, I hope mean, so. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, not a yeah, but, but, but the thing is, it's, 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 the, the scene he's in is, 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 is poignant. It's very poignant. And uh, uh, what was the thinking? Did you have an idea for where he'd be in the film in advance? Or uh, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there were discussions with all of us about where where we knew. Obviously, we were going to have a Stanley cameo, and we didn't want it to be just some passing thing. Where like, oh, we he's the cops that we passed by, you know, we wanted to give him a real moment, 
um, of emotion and something that advanced the plot in a really important part of the movie. And we talked about a couple different things, but this one, I can't remember whose idea it was to have him be the shop owner, but um, it, it seemed exactly the right idea right. because it was able to be sweet and funny and honoring his, his legacy, which was the, was the goal even, even from the beginning because the movie is the logical extension of, the, of his democratization of the superhero that he did with Spider-Man back in the 60s by making it a regular person, uh, a nerdy teenager from a, a lower middle class town in, I mean, Brooklyn, in, in Queens, and, and having him just be not an alien from outer space who uh, is super strong or a, a billionaire, um, but, uh, but just someone that you could be like, oh, that could be me. And so this movie is a, just a massive extension of that. So we really felt like we wanted to honor him. And, and then obviously after his passing, it took on a whole other dimension to it. I'm going to ask, this possibly my last question, because I'm going to throw it open, but I'm going to ask you the one I asked you outside, because the answer was so good. Um, uh, the kingpin, uh, his design, uh, you know, it was, it was unusual. I mean, in the comics, he is a larger-than-life figure, and he is big, but he's really big here. So what was the, what was the thinking? Was it based on a particular artist, or was it uh, what was the thinking on that? The, the thinking was Sienkiewicz. Mm -hmm. So any, anybody know anybody who knows the work of Bill Sienkiewicz, yeah. I think recognizes his how he like does these super uh, expressionist renderings of characters and. And uh, our production designer Justin Thompson uh, uh, and and us were absolutely in love with this crazy portrayal that uh, Bill Sienkiewicz had of the Kingpin. So we were we we also felt like uh, it was going to be a good metaphor for the Kingpin's role in the film. You know, we've got this super collider that you know threatens to open a black hole, and we said, oh, maybe the Kingpin can kind of be like the physical manifestation of that idea of a black hole that everything gets sucked into and can't escape. So so uh, we really wanted to see if it could work, and then there were some cool animation aspects to it, too, that, that were really fun, just having this black mass with a head and hands that you could kind of move around, and it was the cool, uh, uh, the cool animation thing. Pretty good. That's okay. There's the answer. All right. Do we have any hands? I see 